What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? They learn important lessons on the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. This is true for both men and women. Ernst & Young found that a whopping 94% of women holding a C-suite position played sports. Their wins and losses shaped their habits and who they would become. Join me on my journey to sit with some of the brightest executives in the world as we discuss how sports shape their professional trajectory. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, the voice of America's CEO community. I'm your host, Don Yeager, and this is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is Rodney Bullard. Rodney leads Chick-fil-A's community engagement, philanthropic, and sustainability strategy as vice president of corporate social responsibility for Chick-fil-A, Inc. And he is also the executive director of the Chick-fil-A Foundation. Before coming to Chick-fil-A, Rodney served as an assistant U.S. attorney, prosecuting complex criminal cases. For his service, the United States Attorney General presented him with the Department of Justice Director's Award. And prior to his role there, Rodney was selected as a White House Fellow, the nation's most prestigious public service fellowship. As a White House Fellow, Rodney was placed at NASA, working directly for the NASA Administrator. Rodney also previously served at the Pentagon as a Congressional Legislative Liaison in the Office of the Secretary of the Air Force. Today, I am excited to discuss how going to the Air Force Academy to play college football shaped Rodney's leadership trajectory. Grace is a big part of leadership. When you take care of people, I truly believe they take care of you. Part of that is understanding that people are going to fail. They're going to fall down and that we have to be grace filled in doing that. Because if we have to get to the end of the journey, if we have a thousand miles to go and I stumble on mile 100, I still have 900 miles to go. So I need to get up and I need to pick them up and we have to go together. Rodney, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Don. It's truly a pleasure to be with you today, my friend. One thing that stood out to me about you, your life, your childhood is how deeply sports clearly run through your family's blood, right? Your father played for the Broncos. Yes. So I'm going to imagine you weren't very old when the first football was stuffed in your hands. You know, ironically, I was not really good at football until early on. In fact, I tell the story that my very first game playing football, I got into the game late. I did not realize I was getting into the game late. And I began to tackle the quarterback, and I was a defensive lineman. So I was really, really excited to tackle the quarterback and sack him. And he looked at me and he said, look at the scoreboard. The game is over. You just got into the game in the last few seconds. <laughs> and so I was so embarrassed. Now, the next year I started on varsity because I was so determined that I was going to try and put that misery behind me and that bad memory behind me. But yes, my father played football. He played Morehouse College here in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. He still holds records from Morehouse College from his days in 1965. And that was really cool. But to be truthful, my father was more of a minister to me. Mm -hmm. He was a big man. My father played offensive lineman and he had all sorts of football stories. So it was the stories that I really kind of lived through and that inspired me to play as well. I love that. And uh, I got to tell you, he's offensive lineman. You play defensive line. Did he ever say line up against me here? He tried it one time, but it was only one time. <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it. There we go, Dad. So I read a story that said that when you were six years old, your father put you on the phone with his mentor, Benjamin Mays. Yeah. Dr. Mays was a minister credited with laying the intellectual foundation for the civil rights movement. And he was one of Martin Luther King's mentors. Yes. What wisdom did Benjamin Mays share with you? You know, it was an amazing conversation, Don. I tell you, I was six, so I don't recall all of it. I do recall that I did not want to have it, that I had some other things on my mind at six years old. But he puts me on the phone with Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. And I remember Dr. Mays said this, Rodney, I want you to go out and get as much education as possible. I want you to go to the best schools that you can get into. 
I want you then to bring that education back to your community because I want you to understand this, that that education, it is not for you. Those experiences, they aren't for you. They're so that you can invest and lead so you can bring it back to your community. And that's always stuck with me. How about getting that while you're in first grade? I know. Right? You know? I know. <laughs> Dr. Mays, do you mind if I like graduate from first grade first? Do you, are you yeah. okay with that? And then I know you ended up with degrees from Harvard, Duke, Air Force Academy, and the University of Georgia. So needless to say, you lived out his advice. Yeah. You know, what I've enjoyed about that are the people, the people that you meet, the diversity of people that you meet, the diversity of leadership styles and lessons and experiences. Yeah. In that journey, I mean, listening to the way you are a sponge for all these leadership opportunities, give me one person in that journey, along that educational journey, a professor or someone you had a chance to encounter who just was game-changing for you. I would say the person who was really game-changing for me was a guy by the name of Professor Eggers. Professor Eggers was one of my professors at the Air Force Academy. And I just recently went to his funeral mm. about a year ago. It was so many of us who came back and it was interesting because it was uncoordinated. We all just kind of showed up at the funeral because he had been so instrumental. I said I played football at the Air Force Academy and I went to the Air Force Academy in part because they had a good football team, but they also had a good mock trial team. Professor Eggers was the professor over the mock trial team and they already had a team assembled and I got there and he said, we really don't have any room for you, Rodney. And I said, oh, I really would like to have a team. And he said, well, you know what, Rodney, I would like for you to think about maybe starting your own team. And he allowed me to start my own team and to recruit. He said, if you come back within a week and you got enough people, we'll field your team. I'll make sure we sponsor you. And I came back with some ex-football players and some other vagabonds, and we started our own team. And our team ended up being number one on the West Coast. And I was an All-American mock trial participant. And I tell folks that I prayed to God to be all American, but I wasn't specific. I was talking about football. And somehow he got confused and he had mock trial. But it led to me going to law school. Right. It led to a scholarship in law school. It led to the foundation of all of these things. And Professor Eggers was so supportive of me. That just made a huge difference in my career. Well, first off, I want to know what a vagabond at Air Force Academy looks like. I can only imagine, <laughs> probably probably not a slacker in any other way. But secondly, I mean, how cool that the professor, rather than saying, we don't have it, so sorry, go, we'll see you next year. He challenged you. That's right. He challenged you to go out and build your own. Then you took the challenge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think about that. I think about that in life. I think about that in business, that there are moments of challenge, moments of controversy that we have to respond to. And it's how we respond to them. It's how we decide that we're either going to start our own team or we're going to pack it in and fold it and go home and be upset. And that really is something that I keep with me. What a powerful lesson. What a neat way for Professor Eggers to teach it to you. Yes. Just a little bit of a challenge. You know, it's funny. I look back at your high school career and I saw there in Stone Mountain, Georgia, your president of the student council, captain of the mock trial team and captain of the football team. You like had all these captainships. Yes. You were like, Captain, Captain. <laughs> in fact, I think that high school has actually inducted you in their Sports Hall of Fame. Is that right? They did. I was recently inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame at yeah. Reading and consequently started a scholarship for scholar athletes there. Oh, that's extraordinary. So tell me, what's the most memorable moment you have competitively yeah. from your high school years? So from my high school years, you know, I'm a defensive lineman right. in high school. And we played Booker T. Washington High School on their field. And we were a much better team than they were, at least we were supposed to be on paper, but the score was really tight. We were down six, nothing, and we were going into the fourth quarter. And I hit the running back. And at the same time, he drops the ball. I pick up the ball and I run 90 yards for a touchdown and we win seven, six. That is uh, one of the most memorable times. And we do a lot of work right now with Chick-fil-A on the west side where Booker T. Washington is. So I don't tell that story that often. Well, especially because they might challenge you to go out there and run 90 yards again. Look here. I still have two downs in me, <laughs> but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. Wow. We'll release this specifically to uh, the Booker T. Washington Alumni Club. We'll make sure. It Please do. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So you graduated. Go to the Air Force Academy. We talk about that, right? You go there to play football for Air Force. And 
you noted that you went there, A, because they also had a great mock trial program. Yes. What was it about mock trial that, in addition to wanting to play sports, was so fascinating to you? How did that become a part of your makeup? So eighth grade, Miller Grove Junior High School, Mrs. Bennett, my middle school teacher for social studies, she introduced us to mock trial. She wanted to introduce us to law. In eighth grade? In eighth grade. And she divided us up into two teams, defense and prosecution. And she taught us some basic rules of litigation in court. I was just enamored with it. And I'd also been around lawyers in the community that looked like me. And, and I was enamored with them. And I just took to it like a fish in water. And it was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a litigator. And in fact, it's what drove me to be in an inaugural mock trial team at Reed Ann High School. It's what drove me then to the Air Force Academy and to law school and to then the U.S. Attorney's Office and the JAG. And I enjoyed just being in the courtroom as much as I enjoyed playing football. It was a similar high, for lack of a better phrase. And in fact, you know, in football, I did better after the first hit. After I was hit, and even maybe knocked down, I was so much better. In trial, after someone objected to me, it was the same thing. It was like the light went on. And in fact, when I was in the Air Force JAG, people would say, don't object to him. Don't object. It's going to make him mad. <laughs> I mean, they didn't want you to get up and hit him. That's what it was. <laughs> I know that when they were recruiting you, the Air Force coaches talked to you about the idea that if you were to come to the academy, it would be, quote unquote, a leadership lab. And you've even been quoted as saying, that it was exactly that. When did you first know you were actually sitting there, a living, breathing participant in a leadership lab? Basic training, mm. doing basic training. As a freshman at the Air Force Academy, you come in during the summer and you actually have basic training ahead of the schoolwork. And then you go into the schoolwork in end of August timeframe. So in June and July, you're basically in basic training. So I was there. And I remember one of the upperclassmen came up to me. He began to say, Cadet Bullard, I don't have to yell at you because you're yelling at yourself on the inside. Mm -hmm. This is about correction. And I want you not to overcorrect for yourself. You've got this. And I realized even though all these people were yelling at me and around me, that this person actually cared about my development and actually cared about me. And that there was a purpose to all of this madness that I was going through and that he really exhibited that, that was important to me. And when I got the opportunity to then be an upperclassman, I realized it was important not just to yell at someone or to push them, but to develop them. That obviously played out in the way you would grow as a leader. I mean, I know how much developing others means to you. That lesson, I don't need to yell at you. You're yelling at yourself on the inside. I just need to help you develop. Can you give us a lesson where you played that out and you were a participant in the development of a colleague or a peer? So when I got to law school, I immediately signed up for Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and I thought that was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Frankly, if I think about it, I was doing it more for myself than I was for them. It was how I would show up and how I would be seen. And I went to a young man's home. He was a foster child staying with his family about eight or nine years old, maybe 10 and I was supposed to spend time with him. And I spent probably, you know, the first two weeks, I was pretty good about showing up. And then after that, I just did not show up for another, basically another year. Then I came back in the next year and he had run away from home. You know, he didn't run away from home because I forced him, but had I actually fulfilled my duty, had I either not taken on that obligation, maybe things would have turned out differently. So it made me think about the seriousness of this. Fast forward at Chick-fil-A now, we have a program that is called the Chick-fil-A Fellows Program. And we have an internship program that we started from day one when I got there a number of years ago. And I'm proud about the investment of time, energy, and hopefully counsel that I've given now upwards of eight, nine, 10 young people. One young lady, she went to law school, and she is now an assistant United States attorney, as I was, in Houston. And she's applying for a White House fellowship, as I did. So I'm amazed. Another young lady went to West Point, and she was on the cover of Forbes magazine. And she's absolutely brilliant. So I'm proud of those young men and women. 
I can't go back to law school and help that young man, but I can help these people going forward. I can develop them. You can learn from the lesson. And it seems, again, another piece of your journey, very important. When you got to the Air Force Academy, you blew your knee out. Yes. You're there to play football. That was an important driver in the decision. And yet now you can't. Yes. How do you adjust and how did that moment of adversity shape the way you would manage future moments? You know, I didn't realize how critical that moment was. I hurt my knee twice, but the injury that put me out happened preseason and we were preparing to play BYU. Big rival. And we had not uh, beaten them in some time. I was doing well. I was having a really good preseason. So I was very excited about that. And it occurred in practice. I was playing defensive end, defensive tackle, and I came in and the quarterback really moved to the left and I moved with them. And all of a sudden I fall to the ground and I was in a immense amount of pain. And I went back to the sideline and uh, I heard coach say, I think he tore his ACL. Mm. And that's what you don't want to hear in football. It was devastating, but my mother reminded me that I had not just gone there for football, but I had other options and that I needed to stop wallowing, stop feeling sorry for myself. That really resonates with me now. I always have options. That God has always provided us options. And just because one door closes, it means another door opens. Look out and see what other talents and options you have. And don't ever think that you're defeated. I never feel like I'm in a place where I have to stay down. And there's always an opportunity to get back up and to win. That faith that I got from that moment still really stays with me. And, you know, I I did recover from it. Probably had another opportunity to come back out and maybe even take a redshirt year and play football. But I discovered academics. I definitely discovered mock trial. I discovered what I think God had for me. Football was a vehicle, and I tell people this, follow your passions, but the passion you follow today may not be the passion for tomorrow. I followed football to the Air Force Academy. I followed my passion for mock trial to law school. I followed my passion for law and litigation to my current role at Mm Chick-fil-A. And then I followed my passion at the U.S. Attorney's Office to leadership and to giving back to people and my passion for people. That passion is a passion that has endured this passion for people. Your passions can change and your passions can lead you to other passions. Don't you hate it when moms are right? Yes. Stop (laughs) following and you know that this they give you the exact swift kick in the pants that you needed. I love it. In fact, you returned to the Air Force Academy in 2019 and delivered a speech that we had a chance to listen to titled, Success is Not About You. When a young cadet asked you for leadership advice, you described the importance of grace and forgiveness. Yes. Will you share that story with us? So went to the Air Force Academy. A young man asked me about leadership, and I told him that grace is a big part of leadership. From my own faith perspective, the example of Jesus, the example of God, the example that he has shown and that God has shown of forgiving us and dying for our sins is an example of grace and mercy. We have to show that in our leadership so that people, one, can authentically and comfortably show up as themselves, and two, so people will, frankly, have an even greater attachment, connection, and desire to show up for you. When you take care of people, I truly believe they take care of you. Part of that is understanding that people are going to fail. They're going to fall down. I'm going to fall down. You're going to fall down. And that we have to be grace-filled in doing that. It's not just a biblical thing, but it's a leadership obligation and it's wisdom. Because if we have to get to the end of the journey, if we have a thousand miles to go and I stumble on mile 100, I still have 900 miles to go. So I need to get up and I need to pick them up and we have to go together. I love that because people will upset you. They'll disappoint you, right? Those things are given. But what you have to do is you have to be willing to forgive and show grace. I love that. Yes. I did a book a number of years ago with a football player you're probably familiar with there in Atlanta, Warwick Dunn. Yes, absolutely. Warwick was a guest on our podcast a few episodes ago, episode 37. And to finish his book, he and I went to death row to meet the guy who had actually killed his mother. Warwick was a 
Mm-hmm. Watching him forgive this guy on death row was the single most amazing thing I think I've ever witnessed in my life. But watching the unlocking of himself that forgiveness gave Warwick yes. was so powerful as well. What a great lesson for you to have taught that cadet and one we could all learn from. Well, thank you, my friend. It's definitely a lesson that has been uh, imparted to me. And Warwick Dunn, by the way, as you know, is an absolute hero. Uh, He's done such amazing work here in Atlanta and in Baton Rouge and other cities. And so, absolute hero. We'll be back after this. Your business phone service should not be complicated to set up, manage, and use. Nextiva connects your phone system with business apps, AI, and automation on a single platform to run your business. With their easy-to-use dashboard, you will be able to connect with your team and customers all in one place. Nextiva, powering communication across the Pac-12 and now the Corporate Competitor Podcast. Welcome back to Corporate Competitor Podcast. I know you authored a book titled Heroes Wanted. Yes. One of my favorite parts is the piece in the book where you describe what it means to be a hero. I love this quote. Every person has a chance to be a hero when he or she sheds self-preservation to become an active part of community. Yes. In many ways, that's kind of what athletics is, right? It's what joining a team is. It's I'm going to give up what's best for me sometimes to be better for the collective. Will you share the concept of the only that you share in your book? So sometimes we think, if only I had this, if only I had that. Right. If only I was taller, if only I had more money, if only I could be born in a different family, we hinder ourselves with that. We have to turn that on its head and think, only I can do this. I have this skill and only I can do this. You know, I have this voice and only I can lend voice to this cause. I am in this job and only I can do something in this role. There are so many places where we're positioned that we're are the only ones, if we just realize it, if we just think about it, if we understand that we're bigger than we think that we are, and instead of thinking what we don't have, let's focus on what we do have. I love that. Flipping it from if only to only I. Yes. Wow. What a powerful lesson. Again, thank you. So the premise of this podcast is based on some research that shows that a disproportionate number of Fortune 500 executives were actively engaged in sports at the high school and collegiate levels. And I know that you work among some other former athletes. In fact, Chick-fil-A CEO, Dan Cathy, is in the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. That's right. Now, we're not suggesting causation here. We know there's more factors to success, but do you think there's a truism that participation in sports helps in the development of leadership capacity, leadership ability? Without question. I think about many of the leaders who are mentors of mine or people whom I admire, they played sports. One, I think there's an element of grit that goes into it. You understand loss and you understand victory and you put both of those in perspective and you get up when you're falling down. There's an element of competition, absolutely, and competition in an appropriate and fair way. You understand rules, but you also understand pushing yourself and you understand the discipline that it takes to push yourself. And there's an aspect of aspiration. Mm. So when you're competing, there's always something that you can compete for more. I think about Tom Brady and how many Super Bowls has Tom Brady won? A hundred. I know a hundred. And he beat my Falcons. So, you know, we won't talk about that. Kind of hard for me. But I just knew that he was going to hang it up this year. I mean, what better fairy tale story is there? You go from the juggernaut Patriots to the lowly Bucks and you take them to the Super Bowl. And you win it all (laughs) in your hometown, which has never been done before. Right. What more can you ask for? But his aspiration won't allow him to quit. In business, we always have to have an aspiration. And Dan Cathy is just tremendous at that. His aspiration keeps him going, it feels. What strikes me so much about Dan and the challenge, right, that he saddled with is he follows in the footsteps of an amazing father, leader, founder, And he has to try to keep that momentum moving. So tell me, as you've gotten to know and watch Dan Cathy, what have you learned about leadership from him? So much from Dan that I've learned. Humility in leadership, just this voracious appetite for learning and meeting new people, and also a willingness to change, willingness to take on new ideas and let those new ideas work on you. 
that's important. Absolutely. I don't think there's anybody that hasn't worked around him that I've had a chance to talk to who hasn't used those almost exact same words. Your career, we already talked about the idea about following your passion and how passion changed for you, took you in some different directions. Mm -hmm. But an important stop was when you went to work as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Northern District of Georgia. How did the lessons you learned in sports help you as you began prosecuting complex criminal cases? They helped me tremendously. Litigation unto itself is premised on competition. It is premised on we're going to get to the truth because we're both going to put it in the crucible of competition. I think that that is important for our justice system. I think it's important for a fair trial. And it's important that both the prosecution, being the government, and the defense, being the accused, have as competent counsel as possible. And so that that plays out on this arena of the courtroom. And I loved it. I loved being in a courtroom with really skilled advocates. I learned a lot from them. But I also learned the power of voice. A friend of mine once said, Rodney, you've got to find your voice. In a courtroom, it is the power of voice that wins the day and that rules the day. You speak up for someone, either the government or for the accused. You speak up for justice. And that calls me to really think about how that translates into a world beyond a courtroom, that we have to use our voice. Just like I was using my voice in the courtroom, I needed to use my voice outside the courtroom. I needed to use my voice outside for people who, quite frankly, needed it. It led me to a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 31, 9, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Mm. And I realized that this power of voice is biblical. And in today's age, it's needed. It's what led me to write the book. And it's what led me to the work that we do now. You are doing some special work. I want to step back real quick, though, because you were talking earlier about aspiration and the importance of having one. Yes. And I couldn't agree more that people are better when they have an aspiration. What is yours? Mm. To use all the talents that God has given me and to use them ably for others and for his kingdom and for the community that I'm blessed to be a part of and the neighbors that I'm blessed to have as friends and colleagues. That's really important. And that shows up in a myriad of ways. Sometimes it shows up in leadership. Sometimes it just shows up in a smile and, and something simple. Sometimes it shows up in a job and sometimes it shows up in running for office. You know, we all have to have aspirations. It will show up, at least for me, probably in a number of ways. It's so powerful to be able to have that ability to kind of drive yourself into the community through supporting others and showing them someone to look up to, just as your father gave you Dr. Mays so many years ago. It's pretty awesome. Absolutely. I appreciate that. As the executive director of the Chick-fil-A Foundation today, you follow this three feet analogy which means that you should help anyone in your three foot radius. Yes. Would you share a story about how the foundation has stepped in to help someone close to the company? So the three feet analogy is in my book and it's something that I got from a friend and I recount his story, Dr. Gregory Ellison. Greg tells the story of when he was six years old, he had not died and he asked his aunt died, how do you change the world? And she said, I don't know how you change the world, but I know you can always impact the three feet around you. Mm. And that was so powerful for me when I heard it that I wanted to tell as many people as possible. And I thought about our work and that our work literally is within our three feet, proverbial and literal in some cases. We go to the Falcons game and I'm a long suffering Falcons fan, as we talked about <laughs> earlier. And I would go there and I would go home, but there's an awareness and an understanding that there are neighborhoods literally right across the street that are in crisis and challenge. They're getting better, but people, individuals, if you walk those streets are within your three feet. And sometimes we go far away, but miss that which is right in front of us. Mm. I try and live my life that way because we don't know what people are going through. It can be the person who's serving me at a restaurant. It can be the person that I sit next to an airplane, they're within my three feet. And now how I treat them, how I show up, how I connect with them or not, that's really important. And in this time of division that we have in this country, I think we should think about our three feet and our connection in the same time. I'm grateful for people who are willing to, uh, at the very highest level, step in and say, 
you know, our job is to look out for others in that process. You may not be able to change the world, but you can change anybody within three feet from you if you're willing to do it. That's right. What a powerful example of greatness. You know, there are a lot of discussion in this world around the word teams. Yes. But the truth is a lot of teams aren't really teams, right? <laughs> if you're trying to advise someone, trying to build a team to take that group of disparate individuals and do something special with them, what are some of the pieces of that bridge they have to cross to create a team? Trust is the first bridge that has to be crossed. Once you have a sense of trust, then you can have a sense of confidence and you can have a sense of comfort. If you have those three things, then you can do anything as long as you competently do them together. But it's more likely that you will be competent if you have confidence and comfort. You can show up as your full self. You can show up with the talent that only you bring. And the talent that only you bring will be recognized and appreciated and even more so leveraged. It starts with trust. And so many teams fail to get that. They fail to build that. They just go towards activity and action uh, without recognizing that there is a person that has to achieve the action. And in the military, we talked about the people and the mission. And you got to take care of the people first before you can take care of the mission. Are there some suggestions you have as a leader when you're stepping in on how to build trust? One of the ways in which you build trust is that you show you care about the other person and you care about the other person's opinions. You care about them as a person and you care about their development, what they want out of life. If you're doing that, then that definitely brings people to this sense of I can trust you. I can connect with you. I can be your friend and you can be mine. I think we discount this whole notion of friendship, this whole notion of phileos love that we really should be talking more about. We want to be so bristly and we want to be so corporate and we want to be so exact. And that's just not how any of us are wired. We should actually be who we are. And within that is the leadership opportunity. Wow. Awesome. I have to tell you, I know from reading your work, listening to you speak, studying you, culture is king for you, right? You would not want to work or be around any place where culture wasn't valued as you value it. That's right. And you talk about it. It has to start at the top. Tell me about the culture of Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A has a wonderful culture that is similar to me, to what I found in the military. There was this egalitarian culture in the military where we had joined the military voluntarily. Nobody forced us to do it. We had joined the military to serve, and we were there for that reason. And yeah, there were other benefits to it, education, but it was to serve because that education and experience could get gotten elsewhere. And Chick-fil-A, there's this strong sense of service that is unique to Chick-fil-A and a competitive advantage that people really want to serve one another. They want to serve the customer. They want to serve the team members. And that is such a powerful culture and such a powerful notion of care in the exhibition of care. Well, and it's interesting because they could have just taken a spot in the pantheon of restaurants that didn't care about, because they're just trying to crank it out, right? Sure. But they set that, as you said, competitive advantage. There's no ROI on caring, right, and serving, but it's there. You can't quantify it with a bean counter. No, you can't. But I think it does show up on the registers and I think it shows up on the books every day. But more importantly, it just shows up how people feel. And it shows up that people want to come back because that feeling is a good feeling. Well, I have to tell you, Rodney, this has been an extraordinary experience. I just love learning your career arc, the amazing ways you have chased your different passions, the lessons you teach and that you offer to others in the community now in this role at Chick-fil-A. And I love that you also throw yourself into the Werfel Trophy, Danny Werfel's work and the way he celebrates people of character in the game of football every year. I love it. Absolutely. The Heisman Trophy for character. It's a special trophy. Danny Werfel exemplifies and exudes this whole sense of character and community service and care. And it's important because these football players, in many cases, are put on a pedestal. Therefore, they have a pulpit to influence people, both young, old, and peers. And that character quotient 
is so important. It is that leadership that we want them to exhibit as a scholar athlete. So love the Werfel Trophy, love Danny. Thank you for your service, frankly, as well with it. We got IQ, we got EQ. We're going to figure out how to measure character quotient because that is uh, that's a strong one. Rodney Bullard, thank you so much for being with us and be able to share these lessons. But most importantly, thank you for being a corporate competitor. My pleasure, my friend. Thank you for what you do and continue to lead. My two biggest takeaways from this conversation were the need for leaders to create trust, confidence, and comfort before asking those they're leading to create activity and action. I also was taken by how Rodney said we all need to reach out to those within our three-foot radius to find ways we can make a difference in their lives. Game-changing ideas. If you could share one habit, one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30-year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager who did that uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K. How you doing? Hey, Don. How you doing, my man? Great, sir. How what they gave to me is what I'm giving to you in my online course, Journey to Greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to Journey to Greatness is normally $399. But for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll. Thanks for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you left us a rating and a review. We will be rolling out a new episode every Wednesday. To be the first to listen, subscribe to the podcast on our website, corporatecompetitorpodcast.com. Plus, as a thank you gift, you will receive a free chapter from one of my best-selling books on the habits of high-performing teams. Stay in touch by connecting with me on social media at Don Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next week, I appreciate you.